if you don't believe in the own value of your services, then you're never going to try to get those skills or be able to implement those strategies. Hello, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. And if you haven't already gotten access to our 60-minute firm owner masterclass, then we invite you to do that. Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. You'll get free instant access to that after you enter your email address, or you can attend one of the webinars that I run on the Smart Practice Method. Today is episode number two, where Ryan and I continue our conversation about the cult of design. So without further ado, we'll jump right into today's episode. So in this conversation that I was talking to with this this uh, firm owner who's uh, been going through the smart practice program and he's on his his he's on level level three he's actually a part of the design council group right now and we're having a chat about this and he said you know one thing that I realized last year through my work with you guys is that I had compartmentalized my business and and I had to the neglect of my relationship with my with my partner with my wife and uh, and he said I I was completely blind I didn't realize that my relationship was at the place it was because I wasn't giving any attention to it. We were like roommates. And it wasn't until working with you guys at Business of Architecture that I started to pay attention to this. But now let's, let's bring this to a broader context, right? All of us, if you've worked in the architecture industry, if you've listened to this podcast, you may work as an employee, you may be a firm owner. There's your, your personal life, your relationships, uh, the time you spend with your family, the time you spend with friends, your personal self-satisfaction and fulfillment in life, all of that is inseparable from business, right? It's inseparable from business. A lot of times we, we like to compartmentalize and we'd like to say, well, my relationship is doing better, is doing amazing, but work really sucks. This is a half-truth because what I found in my experience is that when, let's say, for instance, my career, let's say I'm dissatisfied or stressed out at work, it's important. It is impossible to come home and be the best version of myself with my wife if my business quadrant, if my my my, my practice, uh, practicing architecture is lacking in some way. It's stealing my power. It's stealing my excitement. It's stealing my enthusiasm. And that's going to roll over to every area of our life, right? So this, con- this conversation about the cult of design, yes, it does impact hugely. It's, it's a cancerous mindset. It's a cancerous ideology at the root of architecture, but what we ignore is the impact that this has, not just on architecture and the conversation about it, but our relationships with our children, our significant others. I have a good friend of mine. She's a grown woman right now, and she has, literally, she has a therapist. She's dealing with severe trauma because her father was never around when she grew up. He was an architect, and he flew all over the country building these great, beautiful malls, he was a very successful architect. The company had a private jet. I mean, they were, they were like, in terms of success, they were at the pinnacle, right? But what, what suffered as a result was his relationship with his daughter. And she was like, I saw what he was doing, and I knew he was successful, and I appreciated him. But she's like, there's a hole in my heart that can never be completely replaced because my father wasn't around. Right? So it has impacts. It affects everything, right? It's not just a conversation around architecture. It's not just a conversation around what we do. It's a conversation around our relationships, around our health, and we don't even realize how it impacts things until we see a better way. Now, recently, a couple months ago, there was this blow up. It's probably six months ago. Last year, there was the blow up at SIARC, right, that flew up on the internet. And Mm -hmm. there were, were, uh, it was a round table of some professors who were given a town hall meeting at SIARC in Southern California, Los Angeles, uh, architecture school, for those of you who don't know, the infamous school, SIARC, I mean, sure, everyone does. But so these, these, these professors, well-intentioned as they, as they were, of course, were, were having this town hall. And one of the students asked, brought up the idea of exploitative, what the student thought was, you know, how can we earn a living wage? We see, we see this thing as, 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 young, as young students who are looking to go into the architecture profession, what we're seeing is that um, firms aren't paying us a, a living wage, or they're asking us to come on for free, or they're using our work, and some of the professors even doing this, using students' work without compensating them. Um, or even if they do get compensated, it's at a such small rate that we can't even, we can't even live, right? We can't, we can't pay our expenses, right? And so then one of the professors responded 
And uh, you can go on on the internet and find this clip. Uh, but she said, look, I, I waited tables when I was young in my architectural career. I sacrificed. I put a lot on the line to be able to build the practice that I have today, right? And this is, her invitation was, this is, look, you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to sacrifice. You're going to have to give up something. And look, I get that, right? We understand where she was coming from because, yeah, you've, you have sacrificed a lot to be able to get to where you're at, right? And in addition to that, the students of today, they're not, they're looking for a solution that works even better than that. Right? So let's say that did work to a certain degree, but what did you sacrifice by doing that? You sacrificed your financial well-being. What kind of relationships did you sacrifice because of that? Because you were in studio all the time or working on architecture projects instead of building connections with other people. Right? And so in a way, the upcoming generation is actually, you know, we call them the, the Generation Z or the Millennials. You know, they're actually, they have something, they're demanding a higher standard in architecture mm-hmm. because they're seeing the symptoms of this. So to bring this back, the point here is that we can relate this this blow up that happened at SciArc. Again, it was about financial things. It was about, let's put it this way, it was simply about money. It was about architectural practices not paying young students or people in the industry what they consider to be a lot of money, right? It comes down to financial consideration. So it goes back, we can trace the roots of that back to this conversation around the cult of design that we're going to lay everything on the altar, that the most important thing is the design integrity and that everything else needs to be sacrificed. It's a false dichotomy. We have the false dichotomy between design integrity and money, design integrity, financial success. And the fallout from this is, is cancerous. I mean, there's no other way to say it. It's like, it's like gangrene. It's causing, it's like having diabetes. You know, your, pur- your, your toes start to turn yellow, <laughs> purple. <laughs> it's a very serious issue. It's insidious. Yeah. And, and, this, and this is why it's, um, you know, I appreciate and, you know, a lot of the activism that's happening in architecture at the moment and there's a lot of unions um, here in the UK and... I appreciate the sentiment and you know both you and I want architects to be paid well that's what our whole business exists for so our whole trajectory in our lives is about making architects be paid well and that includes employees you know the conversations that we have of all of our um our clients is about you know you want the talent then you're going to you're going to have to pay for it and you're going to be paying your people proper money. And so a lot of the unions that have emerged recently, both in the UK and in the US, which demand higher fees or uh, higher salaries, and then they've gone through a process of sort of naming and shaming architecture practices when they you know, put a job posting and they've got a, a below livable wage on it. I get that. I, I, and, I, and I appreciate and want the same outcome if you like but i do think that the kind of that the the education and learning and changing this design culture that has emerged the negative aspects of the design culture this the cult that we're calling it this is this is the thing that needs to we need to be aware of and we need to give chemo to if you like (laughs) I agree. It's it's not something that will be um, changed with like putting a marketing module into a university program. Absolutely, it's not, as simple, it's not as simple as that. No, no, it's it's like you said. It's it it is like a cancer. It's it's tentacles has gone. It's so deeply embedded, right? Now here's the thing with the architectural unions because this has been a this has been a conversation recently, right? It's like let's unionize. This is the solution here to getting better wages for professionals who are in the architecture and let's have unions, right? Now, what I've discovered about life, and I'm going to back up just a second here, right, is that when we're in a level of comfort, it's extremely difficult to want to push ourselves to grow. So just consider the principle. So there's a principle that if I'm comfortable at a certain state in my life, whether it's the comfort with my health, whether it's comfort with my finances, my natural human pull is going to be to want to sort of rest on my laurels, 
This is just the natural because we don't we don't really want to have to work super hard if we don't really really have to. This is kind of a part of all of us. Now, to a greater or lesser degree, some of us overcome that by we want to be high achievers and we're always growing, etc. But just in general, the human nature is there's this universal law of entropy, right? Without continual added energy, a system tends to devolve. And so what I found, Ryan, is that when I'm at a certain level of comfort, it really takes something. It takes an enormous amount of energy to push myself to a higher level of performance, okay? So this might be, for instance, in in my health and fitness, right? So I, I consider myself reasonably healthy. I went down to the gym the other day and recently hired on a personal trainer. And I was planning on working out and just doing my own workouts like I have for the past several years, but I thought, you know what, I haven't had a personal trainer in a while. Why not? I'll, Tyler, who used to be my trainer a couple years ago, texted me, hey, Enoch, I'm back in town. Would love to chat with you. So I'm like, well, let's give it a try, right? So I went down this past Friday, went down to the gym, and uh, Tyler gave me his assessment. And what was interesting is his assessment was all based upon mobility, right? So he, I'm 45 years old now, 45 years young, and so he had me do these different mobility kind of stretches and poses and and uh, and I was just I was exposed I was realizing how lacking my because I sit all day so my uh, these these muscles along the front um, the hip flexors are extremely tight my groin is extremely tight I mean I'm on the way to a hip replacement because I sit so much right now what does this have to do with comfort so the idea is that like it's, it would be very easy for me to sit in my office every day and just, I'm very busy. I have six kids. We have a business to run. Um, I'm, I'm involved in my church. I mean, I got a lot going on. It'd be very easy for me just to rest on my laurels here. However, there's something inside of me that I'm looking ahead to the future. I'm saying, you know what? I don't want to have a hip replacement when I'm 50. I want to be able to have flexibility, mobility, and strength long into my future life. All right. Now, what does this have to do with the idea of architectural unions? Well, consider that as architectural practice owners, if I'm a practice owner, it's very easy to maintain the status quo. And what's the status quo? It's what we've paid people in the past. It's the business practices that we've paid people in the past. It's the kind of marketing that we've done in the past. It's the way we've managed our finances based upon how we did in the past. I mean, I was just talking with a firm owner just today, as a matter of fact. It was a younger, uh, a guy and his wife took over a firm from the founder. And the way the founder ran the practice is the old school way of running architectural practice. Um, It was just by the sheer force of work. Everything was in his head and he worked long hours and he was a workaholic and he probably undercharged a lot, right? But he just pushed forward his practice and had success based upon the pure energy and time that he sacrificed in it. Well, this firm owner couple are talking about like, we don't want to do it that way. We know it's possible to set up a business with systems, with people, with processes, such that you actually, a firm owner, you actually get freedom. You don't need to sacrifice your life and everything on the altar of that, right? So the point is, is that the status quo has a pull. The status quo, it's inertia, right? The inertia. That's another one of our laws of physics. There's that this inertia, an object at, at rest wants to stay at rest and an object at movement wants to stay in movement, Right. So with architectural unions, what they do is architectural unions are actually putting pressure on firms to raise fees, okay? So the pressure to raise fees, sorry, not to raise fees, to raise salaries and compensation for employees, right? Mm -hmm. The pressure to raise the compensation for employees, it can be internally produced or it can be externally produced. Going back to my fitness analogy, my desire to actually improve my health and get my my body mobile and functional again, it can either come from my initial, like my internal drive to do that, even though I'm comfortable now, my my internal drive to, to be healthier and push myself, or it can come because of some tragic health thing that happens in my life where like, for instance, I pull my back out and then suddenly I realize how out of shape I am or the doctor diagnoses me with type 2 diabetes and suddenly I recognize, oh shoot, I got to make some lifestyle changes here. So if we look at this principle, the fact that we as human beings, we want to stay in the status quo naturally. And to be able to break out of the status quo, two things, usually two things will happen. Number one, something disastrous happens that causes us to want to make a change because it's so painful. Or we're proactive because we see the benefits of where we could head and we want to avoid that pain. The latter is very, it's rare. It's rare. Right, The number of practices that actually want to improve and change to be able to proactively change their business practices is very small compared to the practices that wait until 
the recession happens, that wait until someone dies, that waits until uh, an employee leaves, and suddenly they realize, oh my goodness, I have to make all these changes, okay? So the way I see the architectural unions is that their response to the fact that architectural practice owners have not of their own initiative embraced better business practices to become more profitable, to become more financially abundant so they can afford to invest in their employees, so they can afford to create the best culture, so they can afford to be highly paid, right? There's this there's this false narrative in the architecture industry, like you mentioned, Ryan, at the beginning of this podcast, that as an architect, we don't get highly paid. We can't get highly paid. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And mm. so what unions are doing is they're coming in, they're saying, okay, we're going to apply some outside force that's now going to force architects to actually have better business practices. Now, that's fine. If as an architect, if that's what you need, if you need to sit and wait until a union comes along, your employees band together and demand higher wages, well, that's something you're going to have to, it's going to have to happen to you, right? However, it doesn't need to be that way, right? The unions are a solution to a problem that shouldn't exist. If we were more aware of the way that we're running our businesses, our practices, and the impact that a poorly managed and a poorly run or a practice that isn't using best practices, the impact that it's having on our lives, on our families, on our health, on our well-being, architecture would be a very different profession. Mm. But we get a bit of, as you mentioned, it goes back to the cult of design. We get a certain amount of self-righteousness, don't we, Ryan, about design, right? So instead of making the money because we find ourselves incapable to be, to make a lot of money financially, or we have stories about the morality, the ethics of money. Well, we need to feel justified somehow in what we're doing. Every human being wants to feel justified, wants to feel righteous, wants to feel like they're right. And so we rest our laurels on this idea of design, which has become, as Ryan mentioned, a religion. It's become a cult, the cult of design. And this cult of design, if it's left unchecked, we're seeing the symptoms. Because 20 years ago, when I was you know, first starting out in architecture, um, even at that time, we were having the architectural profession, what architects do, began to be eroded by other paraprofessionals coming in. Now, what's interesting, if you look at some of the other industries, like, for instance, I'm thinking about law. In law, they have paraprofessionals, right? So you have professionals and you have paraprofessionals. In, in medicine, you have professionals and paraprofessionals. A professional would be the doctor. The paraprofessionals would be the physician's assistants, the nurses, uh, the, 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 the medical technicians, like everyone else that doesn't need to have the doctoral degree. In, in, uh, in law, we have the attorney that has the law degree and, and the licensing, and, and then under them, we have a paraprofessional, which would be a paralegal, right? So ultimately, it's, it's, these, are, these are industries that have responded to market forces by making the business itself more efficient, right? Because we know if you have a highly paid architect doing something that an intern could do, that's an inefficient use of resources, right? However, in architecture, just to, to, put, to, to put forth another point here, is that architecture has no route. There's no, there's, no prof, there's no paraprofessional route in architecture, for better or for worse. It's a conversation that needs to happen because the way that architects become trained is they go through internship, they go through their, their licensing exam, then you become a licensed architect, right? So it's almost like you have a hospital where everyone's a doctor. Even the janitors are like on the track mm-hmm. to become doctors. <laughs> So where's the place for the paraprofessionals in the architectural industry, right? So this is just pointing out that there's, there's so many lessons that we could learn about the way to operate an architectural practice from other industries that we, however, we blame the fact that we're not profitable. We blame this on the industry at large. We blame this on our clients. We blame this on people who don't get the value of architecture, which is all certainly true to an extent. But at the end of the day, we do it to ourselves. We're the ones that don't value what we do enough to be able to, let's let's say, just make it rain, right? So here at Business, like, can we, is it possible to marry the money conversation of having a highly profitable practice with the conversation of having good design? Because historically, there's this, this divide that we've seen in architecture where you have the design-centered practices on one side 
and then you have the commercial focuses practices on the other side. Now, you do have some that bridge the gap, and there are some practices that have actually started, and we're seeing a trend. We're seeing a trend of architects and practices starting to wise up, and simply because they're being forced to. They don't have a choice. I think it's, I think it's, you're spot on. I think there's um, a lot of practices that that are bridging that gap of being design of retaining a design sentiment or design focus if you like but underpinning it with really healthy business practices yeah and 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 i think there is um when you know we've interviewed a number of these practices on our on the podcast and um practices like Roger Sturt Carvers and Partners, where I used to work, springs to mind, or Olsen Kundig, another one, which the kind of quality of the work that's coming out of these practices is astonishing. And it's underpinned by really good business practices. Bjark Engels would be another one. Uh Um, And then there's other practices on a much more kind of smaller boutique scale um, that are retaining and managing good business practices um and you know going against that idea that good design and good business don't go together and I yeah think- let's let's go let's go back to the <clears throat> Ryan. let's go back to the flight of these mid-career professionals out of architecture because this is one of the mm. problems that firm owners are suffering the industry is suffering right now because of this not only the industry but our clients and the crazy part is is that actually this is actually impacting the built environment like think about that for a second. So let's let's take this problem back. So we have the lack of mid-career professionals, which means that architects can't take on as much work, right? So which, where, oh, where are they? Go ahead. <laughs> this where, is a, yeah. Well, let's talk about where that. Are they? Where are they? Where, where have they go? Where, I, I'm one of them. Do? You're you're one of them, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> we're we're a couple of we're right here. Well, here's here's a conversation. Remember the conversation we were having with Chris the other week. Remember. So we, we, need to, we, need, we need to get back in the field, Enoch. I know. Let's, let's go start doing architecture again. Ed, does anyone want to hire me? I'm unhirable by now. No one wants to hire us, Ryan. There's no chance. Yeah, <laughs> Ryan, do you remember the conversation we were having last week with Chris? So Chris, um, Chris runs a very, very, very successful um, residential architectural practice. They do um, work for some of the, you know, the top individuals in the world. And, and recently... They, they had someone on their team who left the practice because he could get paid more. He was more on, he was on the visualization side. He could get, he could pay, get paid almost double or triple what he was earning in architecture, moving into the special effects and like uh, film industry. Yep. Like think about that for a second. So you're, you, you kind of mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, you know, this idea in your manifesto as well, that architects can get paid more highly with their skills outside of architecture oftentimes than they can on the on the inside of if they stay within architecture. This is an example. And so how do we as architects, how, what's the impact on the industry when we're losing people to other, we're now, now we're not just competing with other architectural practices, but we're actually losing people to other fields. I mean, it's hard to compete with that, right? Yeah, it's, it's and, wild. And what's the root cause of that? Well, it's a money conversation. It comes down to lack of money. And why does lack of money exist in a practice? It comes down to the fees that the, that the architects are able to charge. And why can architects not charge higher fees? Well, we can blame clients that clients just aren't willing to pay for it. But at the end of the day, here's the thing. We're the architects. We're the ones charging. <laughs> yeah. and I mean, you know, it, at the end of the day, our fees are at a direct correlation to our business skills, marketing and sales primarily. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not in, in the architecture industry is a mature industry. So it's, it's gone through that phase of, um, being a brand new entrepreneurial field or, a you know, like on the, on the, it's like a, it's not a frontier industry anymore where it's unregulated and you know you can make it you can make it big you know like how manhattan would have been 400 years ago where we, where all you got to do is just go and buy a, just put your 
stamp on a piece of land and then you're going to make a load of money out of doing it. 400 years ago, Ryan, there were just Native Americans running around Manhattan just to let you know. <laughs> United States is only 200 years old, man. I mean, we're not, we're not like the UK you know where I you mean, guys have been around for a thousand years. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if, you, if, 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 you had, if you had if you had land in, in 400 years ago, well, the Native yeah. Americans did, didn't they? And they, yeah. they, were, they, were, they were swindled. They, they were, they were living, they were living in, they were living in peace without, without fences, Ryan. In, in the early days then of the, of, of say New York and the, and the settlements, right. It didn't take much to kind of lay claim to land and, right, right. you know, that right. land would then become extraordinarily valuable now. Okay. But there's mm -hmm. a whole other, there's a whole other part of that as well of, of, of the frontier and kind of having the, the the courage or whatever it was to leave Europe and then come and settle in a new land. That takes something as well, which is very similar to kind of, you know, being an entrepreneur, if mm -hmm. you like. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about all the, all, the, all the bad stuff that those guys did mm -hmm. as well, which isn't about mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur. But the, the idea that, you know, a piece of land in New York many years ago was much easier to come by and was much easier to make money out of. Whereas now, today, of course, you can still make massive big money in New York um, as, a, as a real estate developer, but you've got to be well, you've got to be so much more sophisticated. Mm, mm, and you've got, to have, an you've, got to have your, yeah. you've got to have your skills really, really dialed in. And you've got to be able to be really good, like commercially focused. So same thing in architecture, that the industry has matured and it's highly competitive and we're competing against all these other kinds of indus uh, industries as well. So our business acumen is now more important than it's ever been. But on the, on the flip side of this is that um, actually having business acumen as an architect and financial literacy as an architect, that's a massive di differentiator. Mm. Mm. Because of the because of the cult of design, exactly. It's an and this is great, Ryan. It's an opportunity for yeah. certain architectural practices, and we're seeing this, especially with some younger practices that are recognizing the gap in the market. So what what I what it sounds like you just described was brilliant, which is that the architectural industry has matured and evolved, but architects' skills in the areas of marketing, selling, business development, practice management has not kept pace with the maturity of the industry. And so as we're saying, as like I mentioned previously, we've seen an erosion of architects' responsibilities from, I, I guess I opened a loop and I didn't even finish that thought. But back when I was talking about paraprofessionals, you know, over time in the 20 years that I've been practicing, what I've seen is I've seen an erosion of architects' responsibilities. And any architect who's been around for a while has seen this as well that 40, 50 years ago, architectural practices largely did most of the things involved with building and design. And then they would, the contractors would build it, right? The builders would build it. Nowadays, with the project, you're going to have an assorted cast of characters. You're going to have an owner's representative. You're going to have a construction manager. You're going to have um, low-voltage designers. You're going to have security consultants. Like, all these people are things that used to be done in-house. So, as, as buildings have gotten more complex, there's been a greater demand for other people to come in and fill these needs. I mean, I know for a fact that construction managers, and I, I have a friend, she runs a, const a very successful construction management firm here in my local area, and uh, she didn't even have a background. She was an entrepreneur. She just saw an opportunity, um, started to go into school board meetings, and launched a construction management company. And uh, she has a private plane. She, you know, she takes a couple a couple weekends a month to fly to the coast. I mean, the company is ra massively profitable, right? They're making tons of money. While architects are like feeling guilty, they're having this shame, this proposal shame, right? It's like the we all know the proposal. <laughs> you know the proposal shame, <laughs> right? Sort of like that dream where you like you're 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 dreaming that you wake up, you're dreaming that you go to school without underwear on. It's like that same feeling. Like everyone, <laughs> it's like when you send that proposal, you just have this feeling of dread inside, like you're naked. <laughs> the mm -hmm. proposal shame, right? Well, these other people, they don't have proposal shame. They're willing to charge what they're worth. They're willing to charge because they value themselves. They value themselves. Now, so now this this is this is really deep. Sorry, continue. That was no, deep. please go ahead. 
But, uh, this this idea, and you, again, you touched on it earlier about, um, you know, one of the root causes here is that we're talking this big game of architecture and the cult of design, um, you know, and the, the power of design, if you like. But then, clearly, we are we're undervaluing ourselves if we're not if we're not willing to put the fee on it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and we're not to, willing to, to learn the skills to to be able to put the fee on it. Well, and to make that stick, right? To be able. So here's the thing, right? Is that we have to be able to have take the responsibility for the fees that we're charging. And I don't think most architects do. I don't think that really enters our mind. I think that we believe there's this belief that the fees we charge are limited by the marketplace. They're limited by what people are willing to pay. When what we're ignoring is the great... Now, to a certain degree, yes, people are willing to pay a certain amount, right? You can't go to a residential client and they, they want to do a million-dollar house and you're like, my fees will be $10 million. But even, 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 with that, even with that enormously ridiculous example, I could see a scenario in which that might actually happen. Mm -hmm. Because the thing with marketing and sales, marketing and sales are simply tools to be able to help you build demand for your services. That's what marketing and sales are. And if you don't believe, if you don't believe in the own value of your services, then you're never going to try to get those skills or be able to implement those strategies. Hey, Enoch here, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation that Ryan and I had about the cult of design, a very, very important topic. Be sure to tune in next week for part three and the final segment of our conversation about the cult of design. And that's a wrap. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.